We're here as Digital Taxidermy to take you on a stroll through rural historic East Anglia. Um, we're going to take you around the areas to show you the places that inspired our latest Kickstarter and um, explain a little bit of why they're important. So yeah, so I'm Theo and this is Neil. Yep, and we're stood on the site of Truel Common. So what Firstly, true well, tree well, what was it, Neil? Well, um, from the old English and the slovenly nature of uh, the East Anglian dialect, I would assume that we would be pronouncing it as true well common. So, what was common land? So, in pre industrial England, um, large country estates dotted all over the landscape and they supported hundreds and hundreds of families. Um, these, these estates uh, worked land, uh, had small industry on them uh, and were owned by the lord of the manor. The enclosures were small patches of lower grade farmland that wasn't profitable for the manor to work. However, um, they did then allow the local populace to work them for free. This meant that they had access to land to be able to grow their own food that wasn't part of the uh, estate's property. What sort of buildings? So the, the Kickstarter that we've done has been looking at the traditional buildings that sort of are dotted all around this area. So tell us a little bit about the kind of buildings like the one we've got behind us that you would find on in a 16th, 17th century East Anglia. So behind us is a kind of uh, typical timber framed cottage. Uh, this cottage is made from, um, you would have a brick or base uh, or stone plinth, um, which laid out the foundation. Uh, on top of that, you would have an oak timber frame constructed um, to create the outer frame. Uh, on in between there, you would often have wattle and daub panels. Uh, wattle and daub would often be made of things like hazel or willow interwoven to create frames and then would have um, mud, straw and dung used to create um, a skin uh, and then often lime rendered over the top. So we've incorporated those themes and features into our models. Uh, with a little bit of a stylistic choice just to really make sure the textures paint really nicely so it's given the wood grain a little bit slightly slightly deeper than you'd get the scale but I think once it's painted it does look really nice. We've also used some herring bone which is a little sort of Tudor, slightly more upmarket building technique. You know, not, not for the common person on Troll Commons but still you do get buildings around our way that have those styles and uh, the flint, which we'll, we'll talk about later with churches. But everything there, there's two sizes, small and large, and all the different tops and bottoms you can see in the animation all stacked together to really give you the most stuff for your buck. Here we are in the grounds of a lovely East Anglian church. But what can you tell me about how they're built and why these are such lovely structures? Well, the heyday for church building in England and East Anglia um, uh, began in the, after the Norman conquest in 1066. Um, William the Conqueror wanted to uh, show his power and win the hearts and minds of the people across the country. Uh, so he had a started a program of extensive uh, church building across the nation. This included cathedrals, fortifications and uh, over 7,000 of these types of churches which have the characteristic Norman tower. When there are also examples of round towers, hexagonal footprints, um, dotted all around the place. Um, interestingly enough, the round towered churches appear predominantly in East Anglia. Fairly interesting. Yeah, East Anglian round towers represent. These use local materials in their construction, um, which in East Anglia is predominantly flint. 
So let's look at some of the techniques used in making these lovely churches. What do we have an example of here, Right, Neil? behind us you can see uh, the stone coin work on the side of the buttresses of the tower, right? And in the, in the centre here is what I was talking about with the dressed flints. So if we come in a little closer, come in a little closer. Right, we've got here the exposed face of the flint which would have been done um, with a hammer to create a face on it, chipped away, make it flat and expose that lovely black glassy texture that um, you, you get out of uh, local flint around here. Just adds a nice bit of detail, it's a nice feature to the architecture. And it's very sexy. So with our churches we've used those same textures and techniques with the, the, the flint that we've tried to incorporate. Now I've put a thatched roof on the one you can see but we've also included a tiled roof. Obviously there are examples of thatched churches around East Anglia so we thought we'd give you the option. Also um, we've made them so you can get inside so it's a much more useful piece for your, what for your diorama, tabletop, whatever it is you're doing. So that's what we've done with our churches. Let's go and have a look at another stunning piece of architecture. So here we are this time now at the lovely Felnethan windmill. What can you tell me about windmills like this? Well this specific uh, mill in this area, this one was erected in the early 19th century uh, but milling in this area uh, dates all the way back to prior to 1776. Uh, in a, a, an early map from 1776 there was uh, a mill not very far from here um, it wasn't this particular one, uh, that was a post mill um, which is a simpler wooden construction um, uh, called because it sits on a post that will turn the entire thing into Which we also, I believe we've made a lovely post mill model, so look at that, you get that too. Exactly, and that post mill is based around another local windmill which is just a few villages over in a place called Stanton. Um, this Thelneatham windmill, um, the uh, post mill was, uh, that was on this site was uh, eventually recorded as being taken down, sold and moved to a place near Dis, which is uh, only a few miles from here. Go that way. Yep, he knows. Yeah. Um, and replaced with this tower mill, um, as I said, in the early 19th century. Um, a tower mill was a stronger structure and uh, it was slightly more efficient using the updated technologies of the time. Uh, this mill ran until, the, until 1920. Um, it fell into hard times after the government's flower restrictions in 1916 until in the 1970s uh, a group of enthusiasts took it over uh, fully restored it and uh, this mill now has working days. Uh, they do have a website about it, details about that are on our website. Have a look, yeah, find out. Yeah, very, very informative website they have with all the history of the stuff that goes on in the mill. And this is a place called Thelneatham which is only a few miles away from um, Trull Common. Which would be that way. And that way, you see. So uh, this is all very local to the area that we're talking about. So with our mills, we've done our best to make them move and spin around, all the sails front and back move, uh, the tops move as well. So you can um, point them in the direction of whatever imaginary wind to make sure you get the uh, best results from your um, tiny little 150th scale grain. We've um, also, with the post mill, the bigger one on the left, we've made it a spool tower, which um, was a kickstarter we did last year. The idea is that you can use the old spool reels you get your PLA filament from and that forms the base, a little brick section at the bottom. So that gives it a bit more rigidity to the structure and makes it a little bit recyclable as well, which is always nice. Next place we've come to is this lovely section of a flint wall. What can you tell us about flint walls? Well, this wall here is uh, quite a long, uh, long run, which seems to form uh, a manorial boundary. Um, and quite often, 
flint walls will be uh, made out of whatever material is close by, hence the flint. They will always be made between piers. So a pier is a, a, a formed pile of stone or brick to, perform, to make a support structure that, the, that will stop it sliding and moving around. It almost frames the flint. And so the flint would then be placed in front, uh, behind some shuttering, which is wooden strips um, and built up layer by layer. The facing flints would all be laid one next to each other and on top of each other using lime mortar uh, as a bonding agent. Then when you get to the top and as you're going, the shuttering will hold it tight and you will then backfill using um, a lime mortar and whatever waste material is lying around. So you don't have to perfectly lay these bricks, these stones all the way through it. Uh, the bulk of the wall is actually just an amalgam. Um, then they'd be capped off with these stones here. Um, uh, they can be uh, form shaped stone or brick. Um, which create these bits which will keep the water off the face of the wall. They use lime mortar because lime mortar um, moves with the wall over time, whereas concrete is solid. It, it's not flexible. It's got no movement in it. So as it moves, it will just crumble. Lime will move with the wall and thus makes it perfect for surviving over time which is what has allowed these walls to endure through the centuries uh, and keeps them around in the landscape today. Fascinating stuff. Let's go find somewhere else to look at some lovely buildings. So what we've done with our walls is we had to think of a fastening method to allow you to put them together however you wanted. So we use uh, old spare filament, another recycling thing we quite like to do. So all those little bits, those scraps you have left lying around, you can use them as the pins to hold the walls together or for the hinges and it really just makes a nice strong reusable joint. So here at another location, a lovely bridge here on a Nettishall Heath, a lovely flintstone bridge. Do we actually know? Do, do we actually know anything about bridges? <laughs> um, we, we, we know some little things about bridges. Um, Fords, bridges, river crossings have formed the centre of trade and community throughout the ages. These have been valuable connections between one area and the other as rivers, you know, tear the land apart. At places where river crossings exist, trade and commerce thrive and often that forms the basis for settlements. Not all parts of rivers are favourable for crossings and thus only um, you may find that you have to travel many miles in the wrong direction in able to uh, cross a river. Small bridges like these and larger ones as well were often erected by the local landowners or certain local communities and managed um, via tolls or taxes on people trading or crossing uh, over the bridges. You will quite often find places that are named toll bridge um, uh, and such to represent how important that was to the local communities. Again, this particular bridge here has been made using local materials, local stone and flint. There's also brickwork detailing in there, um, but bridges would be made out of uh, anything available at the time. Uh, they'd often start out as simple wooden structures, either raised uh, on piles or on pontoons. Later, they may then have been upgraded to uh, stone structures. Depending on who owned the land, stone bridges may have been put in uh, straight away. And it wasn't really until the Industrial Revolution kicked off that you saw the earliest metal bridges. True facts. True interesting bridge facts. That one will be a stretch goal on our Kickstarter, so fingers crossed we'll be able to make that fantastic model for you guys. 
and this time we don't have a picture of a bridge because it's a stretch goal. The bridge will will finish work on the bridge when we get to that point in the project, but with any luck, we'll have enough support, and that's something that we will be able to do because we'd love to make these stretch goals for you. Um, just so you can get an idea of where we're headed, we've made a stretch goal map which takes you on a journey along East Anglia or through East Anglia to uh, various places. We've got the brewery, which is the bridge, sorry, is number three. We've got all the other stuff like a gibbet cage, which is somewhere that, you know, we would, sometimes we like to hang tarred corpses to ward off people from doing bad things. And it's always worked in East Anglia, so we're sticking to it. So we've got some of those gibbet cages. We've got the Norman Tower, which is a lovely building in Bury St Edmunds, which would be a great little bit of fortification. That's if we if we do so well we get there, that would be fantastic. Uh, so have a look at the stretch goals. There are also the social stretch goals. So really to help promote the project to other people, if you share on Facebook, Twitter, follow us on YouTube or Instagram, we reach any of these milestones, we will unlock a new stretch goal. So there's some lovely bits in there on the list. So yeah, share if you could, that would be great. So that was our lovely little tour around the East Angulan countryside. Woohoo! Looking at some of the lovely buildings they've got that we've turned and been inspired by to create this lovely little idyllic East Anglian village for you to use, hopefully, with your tabletop gaming, train set, whatever else. Whatever else we, we can create fantasy or historical settings, yep. villages, working areas out in the fields, micro economies, whatever it is yeah. that you need for your gaming scenarios. So we're off to go and uh, stuff more things into vertices and voxels yep. for your perpetual enjoyment. We're going to create taxidermies of all this stuff. Um, you'll have learned a little bit more about our progress throughout this video. And if you want to know even more about local history, about the models that we're making or what's coming up, then head over to www.digitaltaxidermy.co.uk. If you look under the STL files at the True Common section, you will find all of these models with links through to the new Kickstarter. We've even got a free well that you can lie. Yeah, have a you... little check that out. Um, have a look at the, the pre-downloadable thing that we put on there. Yeah, yep. it's only a small offering, but it gives you an idea of the sorts of things, uh, the, the textures, the shapes, the everything that we're going to be providing in the houses, the windmills, the walls, the churches, all that sort of stuff. Um, we're pretty excited about yeah. bringing this to you. Yeah, it's our first sort of fantasy <clears> stuff. We've done a little bit of, done a little bit before and a little bit of like historical things with some World War II models, but this is something new, so we're quite excited about it. Throughout this yeah. video, you have probably heard a piece of music playing in the background. Yep. Uh, this piece of music is a track called True Common yeah. by by uh, by an amazingly talented guy called me. Uh, woohoo! Woo uh, but it was a while ago. But you could have there's a, there's videos of that somewhere that will appear too so have a look have a listen there will also be a new version edited um, to fit this uh, Kickstarter which is going to be on our YouTube channel all these links in the description below check them out yeah. uh, everybody be cool and um, we hope that you're not ravaged by plague like the Middle Ages um, we'll Hooray. see you later yeah bye. bye brilliant there we go it has finished now Bye.